Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. I hope you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be listening to the show or watching it. If you're checking it out on YouTube, uh, you can watch the podcast now. I've got a video version of almost all of them. Uh, today, got a cool guest, River Certified, Spencer Bauer. He's a uh, big-time YouTuber. I say big-time. People know who he is. I know he probably doesn't like being called big-time YouTuber, but people know who he is. Creates some great content. Um, he's fished all over the world, and uh, he's got some good stuff. I uh, have known who he is for a while, uh, watched some of his stuff. And the other day, as I was thinking of some people to try to get up with to interview, I said, you know what, I'm going to hit him up and see if I can uh, get a few minutes with him. Uh, he's actually down, uh, I believe, in Georgia or Florida, uh, where he is guiding this time of the year. This was taped in the winter of 2023. And uh, that's kind of, uh, he's kind of a snowbird. He kind of migrates south for this time of the year. A wise guy to do it. He's from Iowa, and generally speaking, it's pretty dang cold in Iowa in January. So he makes a uh, little uh, uh, transition south, which is smart, and he took time to sit down with me. Uh, he's an interesting guy. Uh, I was doing some research into him and his background, and he kind of made a jump from a full-time job, which we'll talk about, into doing YouTube full time and uh, that's uh, that's always interesting to me I do it he used a term that I use for myself uh, and, and that's basically we we have uh, several part-time jobs and uh, he's kind of the same way between YouTube the guiding and some of the other marketing stuff that he does with his brand River Certified uh, he's kind of got a little bit of different stuff going on like myself so we kind of got common ground a few decades apart in age uh, but he's at a point where he's not scared to take a few gambles and a few risks. And I, it was interesting to sit down and talk with him about that and just learn his approach on what he's doing, how he's doing it. And for any of you younger folks out there uh, that are considering a job or career in fishing, the outdoors, possibly uh, social media, uh, YouTube, anything like that, it's some good information and some good ideas and some good approaches to things. And... Even for folks that are a little bit older, it's a uh, good perspective and a interesting and good attitude on what he does and what he takes on, and uh, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Let's sit down and have a chat with River Certified. All right, Spencer, where are you at right now? Uh, I would assume that you're from Iowa. You'd be sitting in the cold of Iowa, Iowa but where are you actually at? I'm in Southern Georgia at this exact moment, uh, running some charters down here because, uh, while ice fishing is okay and fun, the idea of running ice fishing charters didn't sound too appealing. So I found a way to get down here when it's cold. Well, you're a smart man. I want to get back to the charter stuff here in a minute, but part of the reason I do these podcasts is the biggest thing is I have a serious curiosity about the people that uh, I get on here. So I'm curious about, I don't get into the personal best and what kind of rod and all that crap that you use that it, that's all been answered somewhere in your videos. People need to watch them. Um, but where are you from? How did you first come to go fishing? Well, did you start out like a lot of us as a kid fishing with a parent, grandparent, uncle? Yeah, basically I grew up in Southern Iowa and, my grandpa, who's probably the toughest guy I've ever met, he had a stroke when he was about 42 and he had to, uh, the doc, doctors told him he had to walk. If he didn't keep walking, he wouldn't get going to be able to walk before too long. So he'd walk all over the place. And then I got a little bit older and I'd always kind of, at least as far as I know, had an affinity towards fishing and I would go on walks with him and we'd walk to a farm pond and He'd sit under a tree in the shade and eat an apple and watch me catch little largemouth out of a farm pond. And we had a creek close to where I grew up and we'd walk down there a little bit. And then unfortunately he had to go to a retirement home. But then I, then I got a bike and rode my bike as far as it'd take me. And then I got a moped and my range just kept increasing and all the way from Southern Iowa now to Florida. <laughs> now it sounded like you, did you keep fishing all the way into 
high school and college because some of us, some people have a gap there. I don't know. They discover girls, cars, whatever, and they kind of forget it for a while. What was your path? Was it a continuous one? Yeah, I never really stopped fishing. I, I mean, there was times where I fished more and then times where I fished less, but I was always getting on the water. I mean, probably the, the time frames where I fished the least, I was still fishing probably 50 to 75 days a year. And now it's, now it's kind of dumb, like ridiculous how many days I spend on the water anymore, but not today. Today was maintenance day. Yeah. And which is something we all have to do as a, a captain, a guide, or even a YouTuber. When did you discover the whole YouTube thing? Where did that when did that kind of come onto your radar? Well, I met a, a buddy of mine, Denny, and he was doing YouTube and I, I was like making things. So he, he made videos and then I kind of, kind of showed a little, I kind of showed a little interest in it. And then I got a camera. My wife got me a camera for a birthday present and I got it. So I'm like, I might as well use it. So I used Denny as a resource when it came to the video editing and, when I, when I make things, I try to make them a little bit better every time. And I've just kind of carried that on ever since then, really. Now, you had a job at that time, I would assume. What were you, yes. what were you doing after, after you got to adulthood? Uh, I was a 7th and 8th grade science teacher for nine years. Wow. A teacher. Very cool. Very cool. What a... Uh, how did you like that? I mean, you did it nine years. That's in North Carolina. You're almost a third of the way to retirement at that point. What, uh, how did you like that? And was fishing constantly in the back of your mind? I mean, fishing, I'm thinking about fishing right now. So it's kind of always in the back of my mind, but as far as the teaching goes, I, I, I like it. I, I mean, I still like it. I, that's one thing I like about running charters is you kind of get to incorporate some of that teaching into it, but that age group was a lot of fun. They're, they're really energetic and you didn't have to bring out the energy. You just had to channel it, which, and I'm, I'm kind of spacey all over the place. And uh, so we were, we understood each other from that level, I guess you'd say. And I don't know. I just, I made everything hands-on, not just because I thought it was the best way of doing everything or things, but because otherwise I'd get bored, you know, like I tried to make it fun for me because it made my day more enjoyable. And it also had the benefit of making class more enjoyable for a lot of kids. And I think more, more effective on top of that, because I mean, lecture, somebody can talk at you and tell you what to do, but how much do you retain? How much can you apply? But when you learn through doing versus hearing and you don't get spoken at, you get spoken, you speak with kids and, I don't know. You facilitate a, a lot more lifelong learning and more meaningful, more meaningful skill sets that would play out for the rest of their life, hopefully. And I enjoyed that. Were you able to impl or, or integrate fishing into any of your teaching there? Because we had a teacher in school, Doug Brogdon. He's passed on now. He was very easily distracted when any of us would ask anything about fishing, you know, like what's the water temperature now and how's that affecting fishing? And he would spin off on a tangent off for 20 minutes. 90% of the class didn't know what the heck he was talking about. And the rest of us were kind of tuned into it and stuff. But did you, and he would sometimes spin this and do something that related to what we were learning. Did you ever? Well, I've played that? that game from a student. I've played that game. So I was, it's not like I wasn't wise to things when kids would try to steer me in one direction or the other, but I'd, I'd play around with it for a minute or two. And then while I'm talking about it, I would steer it back to the main subject, try to create a segue of some sort, but there wasn't a whole lot of direct fishing within class, but I did run a fishing club, like an extra trick okay. curricular fishing club while I was teaching. And it would be, I mean, sometimes we had, there was a few years we had a schedule that integrated it into the actual school day. And then otherwise we'd have after school fishing club and I'd take the kids fishing every fall, winter and spring. And we'd go hit some farm ponds and then we'd do an ice fit. We did ice fishing one winter and um, I had some speakers come in and like, I don't know if you're familiar with the mud bums, but Blaine mm -hmm. Garrett came up yep. and 
and showed the kids how to set ditty poles and build ditty poles and how they go about doing it and showed them the he showed actually showed an episode of the mud bums before it was even premiered mm. or shown on tv so that was pretty cool he's a good dude i really like great him. guys they're really great guys i hate their company did not work out any better than it did because they were really fun to hang around with yeah now you're teaching you start to do the youtube thing and was your first really exposure with putting videos up p part of the river certified brand or were, was there something before that? No, I just, uh, well, yeah, there, I originally called it the outside bend, like the outside river bend. Mm -hmm. Then I heard somebody say river certified about something. I'm like, that's a way better name. So I'm going to change the name of it to river certified. And, but that was pretty early on and I've kind of just stuck with that ever since. And you've been smart. It's for all your properties across the board there with the podcast and everything else. That That's cool to keep that identity to it. Um, when in doing all this, did you realize, you know, I, I can, I, I might be able to do this more than part time. When did that, what was kind of the, oh crap, kind of moment in all of that? Um, when I started making probably a couple grand a month. I was like, wait, so if I'm making this much now, maybe someday I could just turn this into my job and then I'd get to, I mean, I wouldn't call it fishing for a living because sure you go fishing, but then you got to edit the videos. And then um, I ended up putting together a business model that involved guiding because ever since I learned what guiding was, that was really what I wanted to do. But being in Iowa, it's not a destination fishery. It's not a, a destination at all. So you're not going to have tourism. And there aren't exactly uh, bodies of water conducive for guiding. It's not like you're on a large reservoir where things are pretty stable. Like our, our waterways are extremely dynamic. And you got to have your finger on, like I have logs of, of everything. I have fishing logs, but then I, I have like written down at this flow, I can use this ramp if it's this high, this low. And that's all across the board for a variety of different ramps on a variety of different rivers. So if it's really low, I know where I, I can put in at. And if it's really high, I know where I can put in at. That way I'm not guessing. And then I can put together a game plan for clients. And it's just, you got to really, really, really be on the ball all the time in order to put together uh, or be able to run charters on a consistent basis and have the right watercraft for it. Like my, my boat is made to go through shallow water, which is necessary where I'm at. It's not good at anything else. Um, but I guess that's, that's kind of a, a tangent away from your question, but um, yeah. I just, I'm almost wanting to guess what boat it is, but go ahead. What boat it is. I was, I was just about to guess. Are you talking about a sea arc? Well, I'm, I'm mainly talking about a jet. Like a jet boat. Oh, that's even, yeah, to another level of, yeah, very limited in what you can fish in it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what led me to, to Florida to run guide trips because this is one of the few rivers that has a good fishery in the wintertime that my boat will handle fairly well. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, any, any, I have a sea arc, but it's, it's not that it's a sea arc that makes it good for my waterway. Any, any jet lower unit boat would, would be just fine. I mean, I'm, I'm actually dabbling with the idea of getting a different one, but anybody who owns a boat kind of thinks about that every once in a while, I'm sure. Absolutely. What was the original question? I, I totally who forgot. Who knows, man? You, you're like me. You get to talking and you go off on a tangent and it's all good information that you're talking about. Uh, it sounds to me like YouTube isn't your only thing. You're diversified into the guiding part of this brand also. How did those two compare and how much of a juggling act is it with keeping all that stuff balanced or is the balance changing all the time? Oh, well, that you saying that reminded me of the original question. And yes, this is how class would go at times. You get a couple minutes <laughs> off. I forget. Sometimes we lead back. Sometimes we don't. Um, but I'll figure it out eventually. Anyway, um, jump into full time. The idea of doing the guiding along with YouTube 
along with uh, affiliate marketing through a few different companies, social media management and the more, and then writing. I do a little bit of writing and just as many, once, once I could come up with enough revenue streams where I felt comfortable, where even if YouTube took a dip that I'd be able to scrape by, that's kind of when I decided to take that leap. But as far as a balance, I mean, there's busy, busy, busy times a year. And then there's times a year where I'm not quite as busy. And fortunately this time of year, I'm not quite as busy because fishing is a lot more efficient. Like, I mean, anybody who's big into blue cat fishing, I'm sorry to tell you, but blue cats are pretty freaking easy compared to flatheads. So mm -hmm. when, and, and I just happen to love flatheads and I'm going to fish for flatheads and to make consistent flathead fishing videos, it involves catching flatheads. And sometimes that isn't so damn easy, you know? Yeah. What do you think it was that made your channel get traction? And there's a lot of, we all know there's a lot of people in the fishing world on YouTube, a lot of different stuff. A lot of it looks similar. Where do you think your traction came from? Well, at the beginning, I'll just be totally honest. There was a forum, a local forum that is now outdated. Like nobody gets on it, but there for a while, it, it was doing pretty well. And I just post my videos and do a direct URL video post on there. And I'd get a thousand views just through the forum. So that kind of kick started it off right off the bat. And then I approach YouTube just like I do fishing. I, I keep, well, not quite as formal. I keep informal logs on what, what does well, what doesn't. And as long as that's within the realm of things that I enjoy doing, I just do them. So like people love flatheads, uh, if I can, and I love to fish for flatheads. So how convenient is that? And then people love camping videos. I love to camp. Perfect. So I camp out, go flathead fishing. Uh, the concept of big fish from small water, that's intriguing. Like I'm just fortunate that a lot of the things I like uh, seem to be intriguing to people. And I'm, there's a lot of different ways of going about it, but that seems to be what's worked for me on YouTube. And hopefully it continues. Yeah. I've often said a thing about YouTube is it's a, while you're out there and you have hundred thousand subscribers, you're getting millions of views. It's a lonely business to be in. Uh, once the, the, you're away from the, you know, the camera and the boat and it comes down to editing and it comes down to thinking about stuff and processing what to do. Do you have anybody that you talk to bounce ideas off of that has a clue about what you're talking about? Because like me with my wife, I talk to her. She's a good spouse. She nods and tries to give me some kind of decent feedback. But as she says, she says, go talk to your boyfriend about it. Talking about Keith from fishing and stuff. And we'll sit there and talk for an hour and a half about YouTube crap that nobody here on the podcast really cares about. But is there anybody like that that you have some type of connection with for that world to at least air stuff out? I mean, there's a lot of people I know and, and friends with and and then also my wife that I bounce ideas off of. And they're smart people who can think logically and they give me ideas and. And just talking about it kind of gets the cogs turning, you know, and that's that's mostly been enough for me. But as far as somebody in the industry, the fishing industry that I talk to consistently, who's kind of got their finger on the pulse of social media. Uh, not, not really. I mean, there's a few people who run businesses within the industry and I'll talk to them, but they're businessmen, you know, they're, they're not media guys. Uh, so, so not really, not, not nobody I talk to consistently. And I, I honestly don't have the time to talk to anybody all that consistently. <laughs> yeah. When you said lonely, you kind of hit the nail on the head where if you want to do it and do it right, uh, you only got so much time. So like, I don't have any other hobbies really. I fish and then I spend time with the people I care about and that's about an edit and that's about it. And you said you only have so much time. And I think I heard you say in another podcast, when it comes to some of the traveling that you've done, you've went to some pretty uh, exotic places. Uh, and last podcast, I heard you had some more on the radar how big of a jump gamble commitment is it to, because it does take money to do that. And how big of a gamble is that to do versus, as you said, I think in a podcast, you got to do it 
you may die tomorrow. What, what's your approach on taking those kind of trips and those kind of adventures? Well, I like adventure and I've always wanted to do them. So it just depends on what you deem risk. I have the opportunity to do something that I've always, that I've dreamed about my entire life. And it's cool that there's the opportunity to make money off of it, but I'm not thinking of it like that so much. I'm thinking of it. I get to go do something I've dreamt about since I was 15. So I'm going to go, go do that. And if it works out financially, if it works out from a YouTube perspective, great. If it doesn't, that's still okay because I got to go live it up and, and do something I've always dreamed of. And so I don't, and, and I like exploring, you know, What's uh, what's the scariest experience you've had out there, whether it be in domestic waters or some other country? Is that somebody asked me that question one time? Has there been anything that's really cranked up the pucker factor with being out there in the wild? Because when stuff goes bad, it goes bad quickly and uh, a lot of times out of control. Have you had any of those moments out there in all these places? Me personally, I mean, I've had a few, uh, most of them weather related, you know, you get caught in a storm. There's a lot of lightning. Uh, I've had a few in the kayak. Like there was one where I always had a life jacket with me, but I never wore it. And then I got caught sideways on a branch that was, so let's say the current's going this way, the branch is laying this way. And I floated and hit the branch. And my, my plan was to hit it and slide to the side and tie off to it, but the branch bent down mm. and, and my kayak slid up on it. And mm. as it bent down, it still had a tip. So I just took on water right away and I instinctively grabbed the branch to hold myself up. And I quit taking on water at that moment, but I probably had 20 gallons of water, 30 gallons of water in the bottom of this kayak. And the only thing keeping it from sinking was me hanging onto that branch. And I was immediately upstream of a big brush pile. So the, they call them strainers for a reason, you know, like you don't want to get mm -hmm. pinned up on the front side of them. Even if you are wearing a life jacket, it's not safe. Um, there's no guarantee you're going to climb out of them. Um, mm -hmm. But my buddy who was in, who I was floating with came over and kind of gave me a push off of there. And I shimmied off of it and got to the point that I was right side up and paddled to the bank and, got all the water out, but that was, that was the day I, and once we got off the water, I drove to Bass Pro and bought one of those, uh, automatic inflatable life vests because that you. would be one that it was, it'd be comfortable enough where you're always going to wear it. And so if I'm in a kayak, um, I always got that thing on. And, uh, so that was just a, a, a learning experience that I was fortunate. Nothing bad happened. Yeah. That's, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, that's, that's the, sad part a lot of times something it takes something like that to affect some kind of change luckily you live to tell about it and uh it, it you're able to do it i know i'm bad about not wearing a life jacket on a boat uh, a lot of people you know do religiously i don't when it gets dark uh foggy weather i always wear them but i'm in a relatively safe boat as relatively safe as you can be in a boat high sides you know it, it, it it's not anything that's going to flip over or capsize but Good lesson to be learned there. Florida, how how did, did you wind up and why did you pick Florida to go to? Obviously, it's warmer, but there's a lot of places warmer. Texas is warmer. Um, why Florida? My boat. Uh, I wanted to go south where and run blue cat trips. And then you look at bodies of water that are good for blue cats and most of them are big you know big lakes big rivers my boat is not good for big lakes and big rivers because of wind you know you get big winds and you get that chop and my my lower unit cavitates as the waves cause it to pop up and then it's also a three degree dead rise so it slaps the water real hard it doesn't cut through waves at all so I was like trying to think what would be the best body of water for my boat, because I don't want to be putting around when you, I got to go from spot to spot, burning up like a client's time. You know, I, I want them to, I want to maximize the efficiency of the trip to make it the absolute best experience for them. So I, I started looking around, looking around, thinking, brainstorming, and I, I can't remember, or I heard a podcast 
of a guy who happened to fish this river down in Florida years prior to this. And then I recalled that podcast and started looking into the river that I'm running trips on a little more and uh, then started finding articles. And then I actually contacted that guy off the podcast and talked to him a fair amount. And then I, I figured out a place to stay and here I am second year in a row. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I wish I had the, I don't know, drive to do something like this just to get away from my, We're not as cold as where you are, but our fishing does get significantly impacted this time of the year. We came early this year because we had so much cold. We had single digits. Ooh, that's really scary uh, for you being from Iowa. We had single digit temperatures here and it took our water temperatures into what we normally are getting this time of the year. And that's a pretty cool move. How big of a gamble is doing something like that? You seem to be somebody for whatever reason, I don't know if it's age or just your nature. You're not scared to roll the dice a little bit. How big of a gamble is it going to a whole different state and guiding there? I mean, everything's calculated risk. I'm fortunate that I'm in a position where, I have an audience that I can can share what I'm looking at doing and book trips through that audience and then book enough trips to cover the expenses plus a little bit more, which makes, in my mind, makes it a safer, like less of a financial risk right. per se. Right. Yeah. That's still so a I, gamble. I give you credit for that. I mean, if, if I, I've always been of the mindset that, there, where there's a will, there's a way. I just have to find the way, the, the way you know, yeah. and everything's a risk. Any, any business venture is a risk. The, the safest thing is to work for somebody else and get paid every other week and have benefits and all that. And, but there's even risk involved there. So everything's a risk. It's just what you're comfortable with. And I, I, at the way I'm doing it, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. And so far it's working. And if it doesn't work, then someday I'll have to find a different way. And that's all right too. Yeah. How, uh, speaking of the benefits, the paycheck every couple of weeks, do you remember going in and turning in the resignation letter or however you did it when you said, I'm not going to do, I'm putting this, I'm done. I do very vividly. <laughs> Tell us about that and what you were thinking doing it and what you thought when you walked out. I just made it very matter of fact and just made it all about business, you know, and it, schools are a little bit of a business, but my, the administrator that I worked for was very understanding. He's, he was, and kind of understood where I was coming from and respected the fact that I wanted to pursue a passion. You know, I, I really like teaching. I absolutely freaking love fishing, like to the point where it's probably not healthy. And he understood that. So when I told him what I was thinking, cause I didn't make it a, Hey, I'm gone, man. It was a, this is what I'm thinking. This is why I'm thinking it. And this, and this is what I plan on doing. And he was like, good luck, man. I'm cheering for you. I hope everything works out. And that's kind of how it went. And I walked out of there feeling pretty good and just the way that, you know, you want it to. It is nice that we live in a world now technology wise to where something like that is possible because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you either created a television show or you became a professional bass fisherman, or it was very hard to make a living in the fishing industry. So we're at a place in time to where, you know, that's, we're lucky. I mean, we're lucky. I do it. You do it. There's a lot of other, you know, Justin does it over at kayak catfish. Um, you know, he gave up a, a, or at least for now gave up a nursing career job to do it. So I commend you guys for doing that. I remember <clears throat> mine was for another reason way back when, when I jumped out and started working for myself, but, um, uh, yeah, it takes, uh, uh, even though I did it, I still, I like to ask people like yourself, why the heck did you do that? That seems like a good job and a good retirement and all this. And then, 
you know, I'm at that point in my life. I hadn't worked for anybody and I don't know how many years. So that's, that's cool. Do you, are you one of the people though, that has the mentality of, well, I can always fall back on that. Or are you one of those that that's the closed door? I'm not going back to it. Well, first off, I, you're talking about how fortunate we are. And I, I literally wake up and think that every freaking morning, how like, awesome it is i get to do what i'm doing i was talking to my wife uh sunday night and i had a charter monday and i said you know i got to work on monday and i'm excited about it and to be able to say that is oh it's pretty freaking cool but as far as uh the uh well what 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 did you ask me before that <laughs> kind of scattered but it was I I scattered. Yeah, it, it was do, do you have the mentality, you know, my, I remember my Whoa. departed mom yep. about like, you can always fall back on that. And I was always of the mentality. No, because you never really try if you've got an escape route. And well, you, I, I, I kept that in the back of my mind. Like I'm, a, I'm endorsed to teach science five through 12. And every, there's always a need for science teachers. Like my always a need for teachers. Yeah. My, my teaching license is current. I could be a teacher tomorrow. I, I could, I, I have my administrative license. I could be a principal tomorrow. Uh, that'd be a little bit tougher one to get, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't like to burn bridges. I never burn bridges. Uh, I guess I'm fortunate. I have the mindset where I can leave a door open and still pour my heart and soul into a different direction. And, that, that's just what I'm doing. Yeah. What's the dreamer Spencer seeing? What What are you seeing as far as I, I'm sure you're still dreaming but, uh, about something out there and it's not just the fish, but something with the brand and what's like a five year, 10 year plan. What can you see happening with this? I mean, let's face it. We're in a world that we probably didn't see ourselves being in five years ago, 10 years ago. So Lord only knows what's out there 10 years, but have you, dreamed and visioned some stuff up my dream is to be able to keep doing what i'm doing honestly so where i see myself in five or ten years i'm not sure but i'm thinking ahead for the means of changing what i'm doing to ensure that i can do some variation of what i'm doing right now uh, there's a lot of different avenues to go and what avenue i go i'm not sure uh, but I try to keep all options open. I'm constantly talking to people about, you know, potentially going down one road or the other. And I try not to leave any doors closed and never try to burn bridges, at least the best that I can. And so I'm, I'm not sure. I just, I just hope I'm doing something similar to what I'm doing now. And in my mind, that is making an income off of spending time on the water. Now it doesn't necessarily mean me fishing, because like I ran charters Monday and Tuesday, today's maintenance day. I'm on the water filming tomorrow and uh, Friday might be a rain day. So I'm editing all, all day, but uh, I mean, that's just, that's me fishing one day with that within five. And I, I'm, I'm super excited about that and super, not just okay with it, but I love that type of life, you know, just yeah. being on the water. Yep. What's your fishing like? Uh, we'll talk about fishing for a minute since that's what this is really about. A guide trip with you. Um, I, 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 you, you mentioned lakes, but I'm, I'm assuming most of your stuff's rivers. What kind of fishing are you doing for people out there watching? They're exposed to all kinds of fishing. There's, you know, I call park and prey anchor fishing. There's bottom bouncing. There's trolling, drifting, which I do a lot of on lakes. What is your style of fishing either there in Florida or when you're back in Iowa on some of the rivers there? Well, when somebody reaches out to book a trip, I want to know what they want because my job is to provide them with the best, absolute best experience that they can have based on what they want out of the trip. So I want to know what they, what they'd like to catch first. And now as far as my style of fishing goes, my style of fishing is whatever puts the most or biggest fish in the boat. So if people want to catch a big one, it's all right. Like you want to catch a big flathead, I'd recommend this time of year based on my availability. Uh, and we're going to go at this time of day because that time of year, this time of day tends to produce the most fish or the largest fish. And, or if somebody wants to book a hybrid striper trip, because I'll do all kinds of species. We'll do 
I'll do flatheads, channels, walleyes, hybrid stripers. Down here in Florida, it's mostly blue cats and ocean run stripers. But uh, I just prioritize what they want out of the trip, number one, and then we communicate to figure out the best way of going about getting them what they want. Yeah, that's one. Uh, that seems like a smart approach because uh, honestly, a lot of what I do is catfish centric in the guiding that I do. And mm -hmm. there, while most of the time, you can catch fish. You get into some periods of the year when it can really, really lock down. Um, what uh, do you think that's been a really smart move? Uh, or do you wish you could be one species focused on just one? No, nah, man. Like I like doing it all. Uh, I cat flatheads are my favorite. Cat fishing was my first fish in love, but I've learned to, the older I get, the more I enjoy walleye fishing. The older I get, um, the more I really, really like hybrid striper fishing. And I, I, I joke with my wife based on where we live that it's not the greatest flathead fishing in the world, but it's good. It's not the greatest channel cat fishing, but it's good. It's marginal walleye fishing at best. But the hybrid stripers are like, they fly under the radar. So I'm... This next year, my my kind of my little objective for myself is I jokingly say I want to be the greatest hybrid stripe bass fisherman of the world, or no, the world's greatest hybrid stripe bass fisherman of the world is what I, is my my little running mantra currently. Now, do they stock those things into the rivers there? Because we have them stocked into lakes around here, but are they are these reservoirs that are attached to rivers there? Both. There's some lakes that are stocked, there's reservoirs, and then, then there's stretches of rivers that are stocked. But I don't know what it is about our watershed. I wouldn't think it'd be conducive for a sight feeding fish to proliferate like they do, but we grow them big. Like uh, our state records right around 20 pounds. And I, this just this last year, we had a day where we put three over 10 pounds in the boat. You know, is there, there's just some big ones to be caught. That's, that's, that's some good size hybrids there. That's, that's some good size fish. Uh, do you see expanding where you're fishing at to any other parts of the country? Um, I don't know that you would need to necessarily, but could you see expanding that out at some point, maybe to some, uh, I don't know, bigger impact hybrid fisheries or anything like that at some point? What do you mean by expanding it out? Well, you go to Florida now from where you're basically based at in Iowa, like, doing stuff on Clark's Hill Reservoir in South Carolina on the South Carolina Georgia line, big hybrid striper fishery there. Uh, or is that just getting, is that just spreading the peanut butter a little too thin on the bread with getting into too many different places like that? For me personally, probably I'm, I'm planning on running a few trips on the Missouri river. Now that I have my captain's license, uh, I got a few people who want to learn how to bump, uh, but that's just kind of, if you want to do it, let me know. And we'll put together a block of time where I can organize trips for these so many people that I'm not driving back and forth every weekend, you know. Um, but as far as expanding out, the only expansion I could see me ever doing is if I move to a larger, or an area with more or larger water to expand my guide service to bring on more boats maybe. But I don't think that's a good thing where I'm at right now because our waterways are fairly fragile and definitely small. The The thing that justifies it in my mind are charter trips is there's not that many people who have the means to effectively fish it um, in a way that's going to be super detrimental. And then I don't share much. Like I don't name bodies of water. I don't name locations. I sit where I'm at in Florida, but you don't know if I'm going north. You don't know if I'm going south. If you book a trip with me, I'll tell you where to go and tell you where to meet for that trip. And I'll tell you the general area, but, or the towns and stuff where I'm kind of at, but I, I try to try not to advertise anything more than, than I already do. Some people know cause they've been there, but if you haven't been there, you don't know. <clears throat> well, it's almost like you're reading my notes here. My next question was the impact that we as you YouTubers have, uh, on, fisheries do do we have a negative impact uh as far as the fishing burning spots that whole world what's your thoughts on that yeah i go back and forth on that a little bit 
I mean, anybody who casts a baited line into a waterway has a negative impact on the waterway. So where do you draw the line? Because the people who do that are doing it because they enjoy it or they want food or both. Well, I enjoy fishing. I enjoy making the videos and there's going to be some negative impact as a result of that. But I'm doing it in a way that at least in my mind, I can live with. It, does everybody feel that way? Probably, I guarantee you not. But uh, I mean, everybody that is used, utilizing a natural resource is negatively impacting it. So sure. there's got to be a little bit of looking in the mirror for yourself before you point fingers at other people, I guess. Yeah, now, I, I, I'm i with you 100%. I've said that what I do, and I've had people, you know, get on to me about, oh, you're showing too much, you're showing that whole world. I think there's a positive impact that we can have too. And I think the positive impact can outweigh the negative impact. I've heard so many times people say about, you know, my videos, I've never seen somebody throw back as many big fish as you do on video. And I make it a point to show every one of them going back into the water. So in a little way, I think that can send that message that one, you can catch them two you can throw them back and three, you can catch them again. So I, I think having that, that impact, <clears throat> that positive impact is important. And that'll bring me to my last question for you. Uh, and, and you're way too young to be asking this question to yet, but legacy, what do you want your legacy to be in this sport 10, 15 years down the road, whether you be YouTube's even still here, who knows, or there's something else. What, what do you want people looking back at, at you and what you've done and, who you are as a fisherman and an angler and a sportsman and an outdoorsman. Don't put much thought into it, to be honest. And I'm not doing anything where I feel like it's going to leave this legacy behind me. Like most people don't take YouTube too serious. Uh, I tell you what, most people in the fishing industry definitely do not take YouTube very serious. Uh, the, the guiding thing, I'm not like a lot of people look at me and say, I'm not a real guide and I can't argue with them. You know, I'm a part-timer. I'm a part-time everything though. I'm just this conglomerate of stuff that I've thrown together to <laughs> currently make work. And I'm going to hopefully keep it rolling. And I approach every day, like I'm broke and I have to go out and make my money. And uh, that's kind of how I've gone about it. But as far as a legacy goes, I, I mean, I don't put much weight. There, there's about five people that exists on this planet that I really put a lot of thought into their opinions and how they feel. And then outside of that, I don't want to make anybody mad, but if somebody doesn't like what I'm doing or if somebody thinks I need to do something different, that's cool. I might take it into account. I might not. I don't know. It just depends on what it is. So as far as how, cause legacy is based on people's perception and I just don't put a whole lot of thought into people's perception for better or worse, I guess. There you go, folks. Uh, as I said in the podcast, uh, a lot of the people that I bring on this show, pretty much all the people I bring on this show are people that I'm actually interested in interviewing and talking to and finding out more about. Uh, granted, uh, especially with some of the folks that we see on television, we see on social media, or we read about in a magazine, uh, a lot of times we don't get a real insight as to who they are as a person. And uh, with this one, we got a little more insight as to who he is, what he is, what he's about, and uh, why he does what he does. So hopefully you enjoyed this one. If you want to give me some feedback, some ideas, that type thing, uh, you can always comment in the comment section on YouTube, but if you're listening to one of the podcasts, go to DieterMillhornFishing.com, and uh, there's a contact section. You can send me an email, shoot me a text, whatever. Uh, DieterMillhornFishing.com, that's where you can reach out and leave the comments from here on the podcast. Or if you're looking for uh, booking a fishing trip, um, obviously i got a guide business just like uh, Spencer does, and uh, I do stuff here in the Catawba River chain of lakes in the Carolinas. And uh, also links to the YouTube channel and the podcast, depending on where you're seeing or listening to this. That's it for now, guys. We'll catch you out on the water.